So John Barry is gonna speak about lessons learned from the 1918 Great Influenza. And so I wanna thank uh, Clark for uh, arranging to have him here uh, and for all of the people who are helping out on the tech side. And I wanna thank all of you for being here with us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Clark. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you everyone for joining us. Good morning to everyone. Um, as Rob said, this couldn't be more timely, this discussion that we're going to have this morning about the similarities to and the differences between the influenza pandemic of a century ago and today's COVID-19 pandemic. Our speaker today, as you heard, is John Berry, who is a professor at the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. He's been an advisor to the Bush and Obama White Houses on pandemic preparedness and response. And he is the award-winning author of two landmark books, first, Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and How It Changed America, and the subject of this morning's talk, The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History. The National Academies of Science named The Great Influenza that year's best book on medicine or science. Professor Barry was part of the original team in the Bush administration that conceptualized the federal pandemic response plan. He's the only non-scientist ever to give the National Academy's Abel Wolman Distinguished Lecture, and the New York Public Library named Rising Tide one of the 50 most memorable books, whether fiction, nonfiction, or poetry, of the preceding 50 years. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor John Barry. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, very happy to be here. I want to say uh, two of my very best friends uh, were married in this church. And in my days in Washington, I used to play chess on the opposite side of Lafayette Square. So uh, we're going to do this mostly as a, as a Q&A. Uh, Clark and I have talked about that. But I, I will make a couple of uh, opening remarks uh, for us to give you a sense of just how much impact the uh, 1918 pandemic had. What, uh, it killed between 50 and 100 million people. Uh, that was in a world population much, much smaller than today. If you adjust for population, that would be equivalent to 220 million to 440 million people today. Uh, so it was much more uh, lethal uh, than this pandemic, even the worst, worst case scenarios for COVID-19, don't predict anything like that. Uh, and talk briefly about the lessons and get into that more in the Q&A. Uh, the first is the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions. What do you do when you don't have any drugs? Uh, you know, one of the reasons I was asked to get involved in the preparedness effort was because I was quite familiar with what cities did and didn't do back then. And it became very clear uh, that cities that did much of the things that, that we're doing uh, to contain COVID-19, uh, that they were much more effective, had much better experiences uh, than cities that did less. Um, it's also kind of interesting. Uh, there was a Federal Reserve study uh, quite recently of the economic impact, and they found that the cities that had uh, maintained their, their closures for a longer period of time actually had a much stronger economic recovery than those that were closed for a shorter period of time. Uh, so that's one of the lessons. The second lesson, and really the most important lesson, uh, was to tell the truth. Uh, this was a message when I was in those early meetings when we were conceptualizing uh, a pandemic preparedness plan. That was my number one uh, message that telling the truth was the only way that you were going to have any real impact before you got drugs. Um, the reason's pretty obvious. If your proposed measures to contain it depend on uh, the public doing what you ask them to do, they're going to have to believe in, in what you tell them. Uh, the idea of transparency uh, was written into the federal preparedness plan right at the very top. It's written into every single state preparedness plan. Uh, nonetheless, 
as I said in the afterward uh, of the book, you still have to get somebody to execute the plan. Plans are great. I mean, the NFL starts their season today. I actually spent some time after school, uh, after college as a football coach. They're always talking about the players didn't execute the plan. It's the same thing with the pandemic preparedness. Uh, and the importance of truth, I just can't emphasize that enough. Obviously, we have not gotten that out of the White House, and that is a major contributor uh, to the pretty desultory uh, effort and response in the United States. Uh, as far as the viruses themselves, there are a lot of similarities. For one thing, they transmit exactly the same way. Uh, you know, primarily uh, droplets, some purely airborne, uh, some so-called fomites from touch, you know, doorknobs and so forth, uh, although not that much that way. Uh, one of the things that makes them, first, uh, both viruses bind to cells in the upper respiratory tract, uh, which makes them easily transmissible, uh, but they also bind to cells deep in the lung, which makes them pretty lethal, have the potential for lethality. You know, ordinary influenza does not bind to cells deep in the lung. It stays in the upper respiratory tract. Same with common colds and so forth. Uh, MERS, SARS, so-called bird flu, those viruses could only bind to cells deep in the lung. So you're starting out, if you get sick at all, with a pretty serious disease, but because it's, it's only deep in the lung, they don't transmit from human to human. Uh, both the 1918 virus and of course COVID-19 binds to the upper respiratory tract, so it's easily transmissible, binds to cells deep in the lung, so it creates uh, a very dangerous situation to begin with, if that's where uh, you get infected. Another similarity is that both viruses seem to infect virtually every organ. Uh, we now know that uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, does a lot of damage uh, to the cardiovascular system. It has significant neurological impacts and also infects other organs as well. Uh, the very same thing was true with the 1918 virus. Uh, which also is uh, pretty unusual for influenza, although actually all influenza viruses do uh, seem to have some cardiovascular impacts. Uh, the differences are, one I've already mentioned, difference in lethality. Uh, the 1918 virus was much more virulent. Uh, worldwide, it probably had a case fatality rate of six to eight percent. In the West, it was a little less than that, uh, not because Western medicine was any better. Uh, back then, all you had was supportive care. Uh, but in the West, people had been exposed to other influenza viruses and had some cross protection from those viruses. Uh, another major difference, very important, is the demographic targets. In 1918, very unlike seasonal influenza, 95%, uh, 95% of the excess mortality was actually people younger than 65 years old. Uh, the peak age for death in 1918 was 28. Probably two thirds of the deaths were between 18 and 45 years of age. Uh, so that's a, almost exactly opposite uh, the situation today. Uh, another major difference in 1918 you did not have, or with other influenza viruses, you do not really have asymptomatic transmission. You have some pre-symptomatic transmission, but not asymptomatic transmission. Uh, now, COVID-19, of course, a very, very significant uh, proportion of the transmission is caused by people who have either no symptoms at all or before they develop any symptoms. Uh, and the last uh, major difference is the duration. Uh, COVID-19 is much, much slower moving uh, than influenza. Uh, the incubation period influenza is one to four days. Most people get sick about two. Uh, 
Uh, COVID-19 is two to 14 days. Most people who get sick at day five or six. And this has, and they're, they're sick longer. They shed virus longer. They're infectious longer. Uh, everything is stretched out with COVID-19. And this has significant ramifications when you start talking about the economic impact of trying to contain the virus uh, with, with closures and restrictions. Uh, it, and I think I'll stop there and go to Clark and we'll go to questions. Thank you, John. That's terrific. So and you've kind of alluded uh, to this already, but just to pull the string a little bit more, were there the same kinds of or similar political divisions in the country back in 1918 regarding health and safety and welfare issues that we see today regarding, you know, social distancing and mask wearing has become a political partisan issue. I presume there wasn't that kind of thing back then, or was there? Well, there was no partisanship uh, involved in that. Uh, we were, of course, at war. And because of the war, the Wilson administration did not tell the truth. Uh, you know, the first casualty of war is truth. And there was a feeling in the Wilson administration that any thing that was bad news would detract from the war effort. They had created a vast infrastructure, uh, something called the Committee for Public Information, uh, which the architect of that committee said, uh, there's nothing in experience that tells us uh, truth is superior to falsehood. All that matters is, you know, the impact of what you say. Uh, they had 100,000 what they called four-minute men who got up before every public meeting, every school board, every vaudeville performance, and gave a very brief uh, talk to keep morale up and so forth. They banned songs like I Wonder Who's Kissing Her Now from military camps. Uh, at the same time, they passed a law that uh, the Sedition Act that, that uh, made it punishable by 20 years in prison to, quote, utter, write, print, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the government of the United States. Uh, they actually sent a congressman to sentence a congressman to prison for 10 years under that law. It was enforced pretty rigorously. Uh, so this was the context into which influenza fell. And the result was you had national public health leaders who said things like, uh, this is ordinary influenza by another name. It was referred to as, as Spanish influenza, although it didn't actually start there. Uh, or you have nothing to fear if normal uh, precautions are taken. And there was no Tony Fauci back then. Uh, in practically every city in the country, local authorities who knew better uh, were echoing the same line uh, out of, they thought, patriotism to support the war effort. Uh, so the public messaging was, was terrible. I mean, it was just a lie. However, with people dying sometimes in less than 24 hours, uh, sometimes with really horrific symptoms, uh, nobody thought it was a hoax back then. Uh, in terms of, so the, there was no partisanship, but when it did come to closures, the business community, uh, and particularly bars and restaurants and theaters and so forth, uh, there was a lot of resistance there. Uh, nonetheless, the, the almost every city in the United States uh, closed down. Uh, it was really decisions were made by mayors back then, uh, not the federal government, and in most cases, not the state government. Thank you. How, how did it end? How did the pandemic back then end? Was there one event or series of events? Well, two things happened. Uh, number one, uh, and this is one of the differences between influenza and COVID-19, which I failed to mention, uh, influenza mutates much, much more rapidly uh, than does COVID-19. Uh, I think this is speculation, you can't prove it, but it's highly likely. Uh, the virus mutated in the direction of uh, other influenza viruses, which is considerably less mild. And it's a pretty serious disease, actually, but it's not like the 1918 virus. That's one thing that happened. Uh, the second thing is that people's immune systems uh, 
the second and third time the virus came around, their immune systems were much better able uh, to handle it. Uh, but in terms of the mutation, the virus did lose the ability to bind to cells deep in the lung for whatever reason, obviously maintained. They continued to, the descendants of that virus continued to circulate. Uh, actually, some continue to circulate today, uh, but there was really a dominant uh, virus until 1957. Uh, so those two main things, uh, the virus itself mutating and, and people's immune systems being better able uh, to handle it and sort of petered out uh, through the 1920s. Got it. One questioner asked whether it's already too late in your judgment for contact tracing. Well, that's a very good question. You know, if you have 10 cases, it's pretty easy to do contact taste tracing. 10,000 cases, not so easy. Uh, I think it, it would be more or less, you know, and it varies from in one city to another. Right now in the United States, there are, there are places where it is possible to do it. Uh, in places with huge numbers of cases, no. But if you get the case count down to a manageable level, and you build up your infrastructure, then it is possible uh, and should be done. It, it's not too late to improve things. Obviously, as we sit here, the latest count is 193,000 dead. Uh, the incredibly frustrating thing to everybody in public health or infectious disease is that we know that death toll was not, not necessary and could have been avoided if we had done things right. We didn't do things right. Uh, it's not too late to start doing things right and, and cut down the future death toll. Uh, and that's a good segue to the next question. That is, given that, as you just said, we are where we are, um, what more, aside from contact tracing where it can be done, can, should we be doing in order to try to limit further deaths and further infections, especially given the partisan differences now about mask wearing and social distancing and also the skepticism about vaccines? Well, you do what you can do. You just keep plugging away. I don't know that there's anything different. The, you know, for us there is going to be a very serious effort that will start in terms of messaging on vaccines. Uh, and hopefully that will have some impact. Uh, I could also see a nonpartisan effort to uh, endorse vaccines. That's conceivable. Uh, in terms of the contact tracing and things like that, again, you're, you're going to have to uh, get the case count down, you know, in, in New Orleans, where I live, although I happen to be in Washington right now, uh, you know, New Orleans was at one point had the fastest uh, growth rate for the disease in the world. Uh, and the mayor there was, was pretty aggressive. Uh, you know, the state has just announced it's going to phase three, but New Orleans is not. Uh, the bars in New Orleans are still closed. They had reopened and then they close back down. I live in the French Quarter. Uh, it's amazing because all the bars and all the entertainment venues in the French Quarter are closed, and yet you still have big crowds on Bourbon Street on Saturday uh, and, and Friday nights. Uh, you know, you've, so much depends on messaging and convincing people to do the right thing. It's difficult, it's not impossible. There is no magic bullet that I know of. I wish I, wish I did know of. And if someone has uh, something to suggest, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Another question is, have you observed any differences of how COVID-19 is spread into rural America versus how the influenza pandemic um, affected rural America in 1918? And a related question is racial demographics. Of course, racial minorities have been very affected by COVID-19. Was that the case, disproportionately so, was that the case for COVID, for uh, 1918 as well? 
in terms of the rural spread, it's, it's really uh, pretty similar. Uh, 1918 hit the cities first and then spread into the uh, rural areas, but it eventually got essentially to everywhere in the United States. There were a couple of communities that essentially walled themselves off from the rest of the world. Uh, you couldn't get a Gunnison, Colorado is probably the biggest one. And that's not that big, but uh, you can get off the train at Gunnison. They had people on the roads with shotguns uh, preventing you from, from entering and, and things like that. Uh, but with, I mean, it, it, the disease managed to make it by, uh, uh, by sled into rural Alaskan communities where it was absolutely devastating. Uh, in fact, in, in some of those communities, you had uh, 80 and 90 percent mortality, uh, not necessarily because the disease uh, was that much more lethal. It was lethal because they, their immune systems were completely naive, probably never seen an influenza virus before. Uh, but because everybody got sick at the same time, nobody could even keep each other uh, hydrated, uh, much less cared for. Uh, in terms of racial disparities, uh, oddly enough, the African American community seemed to uh, have slightly, you know, marginally lower morbidity, uh, fewer percentage wise got sick, uh, but higher case mortality among those who did get sick. Uh, you can speculate as, as to why the case mortality would be higher. I mean, probably care would. Uh, would be the main reason, uh, although there was not a lot you could do in 1918 in terms of care. And I Another have really, okay, I was just nope. gonna say, I've never heard a, a convincing hypothesis as to why the morbidity was a little bit less, but it was, you know, seems to be statistically significant amount less. Hmm. Interesting. Another question was the issue of schooling. How were, if at all, were children schooled during the 1918 pandemic? Obviously, you couldn't do virtual learning then. How was that issue handled back then? Well, the schools were just dismissed. Uh, you know, the, uh, and, and teachers you often volunteered to do other things. Uh, but to my knowledge, it's not something I really looked at. Uh, but as you mentioned, there were, there were no options uh, back then. Um, and we also, if you think about it for a second, if you had a closure in 1918 of, you know, you had no internet, obviously, you had no television, you had no radio. Many places, possibly most, didn't have telephones. Uh, you were pretty isolated. It was a pretty difficult thing to go through. I mean, it's difficult now, but we have all these other uh, ways of staying connected. Uh, but as I said earlier, the, one of the huge differences between the two diseases is duration. Uh, influenza would go through a particular city in six to 10 weeks, and then it was essentially gone. And even the places that closed down for an extended period of time for the longest period weren't closed for all of that uh, period. Uh, so it was something that people could get over uh, much more easily than I think we can get past this. We were already, you know, uh, in September, you know, we closed down in March, where, you know, every place is open, but in, limit, in most instances to a limited extent. Uh, and we, we still have the stress. Uh, that was not the case in 1918 and it was over. There did come a, a subsequent wave, but they were distinct waves. We have, we're living through a, a much more of a continuous pattern and continuous stress. Right. That's a good segue. One of the questions was, do you expect, as most experts, I think, do a second and more virulent uh, wave in the fall, later in the fall and in the winter? 
Yeah, well, not more virulent, but uh, you know, I think the virulence, fortunately, has been constant. And, uh, but I do expect uh, you know a, a major uptick. It's possible that's not the case. I mean, I wrote a, an op-ed in the uh, in the Times about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, I guess it's four weeks ago now, but you know, I, I was actually uh, in you know address that. Uh, and said, yeah, I, like everybody else, I, I expected. And in fact, I quoted a Morgan Stanley model that was projecting on if we make no changes in what we're doing, uh, uh, the Morgan Stanley model predicts 150,000 cases a day. So I don't know if they're going to be correct, uh, but just remember the highest case count I think we've had yet is a little over 70,000. Uh, so that would, and that was really a one day thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they were really in the 50s and low 60s. Uh, so you're talking about close to triple what our average case count was. Now, will things get that bad? I don't know. Uh, the, the virus is much easier to predict than human behavior. Uh, you know, New Orleans did get it under control. I was talking about Bourbon Street, but those tend not to be people who live in New Orleans. They still, Bourbon Street was still a draw. Uh, and incidentally, in Louisiana, you were allowed to drink on this in public. And, and uh, if, so they would go there with, that, with alcohol and carry radios or, you know, I'm old school when I say radios, but other <laughs> sources of music. Uh, but they could, they could drink on, on Bourbon Street. They just couldn't get the, they would bring the alcohol with them. Uh, you know, and yet New Orleans is actually doing uh, considerably better than a lot of the rest of the state. Um, if you can, you know, again, the human behavior, when, when things got really serious in uh, Arizona, tech, in Texas, uh, human behavior changed. I can tell you that, you know, I'm in Washington now, as I said, Almost 100% of the people you see are wearing masks, at least where I am. Mm -hmm. And in Louisiana, uh, it had gotten a lot, lot better, although it's certainly nothing like that. Uh, you know, when it gets serious, people change their behavior. Uh, so it's possible we could avoid uh, the worst case uh, things in the, in the winter. There's another factor in that. Uh, you know, the so-called herd immunity. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not going to have herd immunity or anything like it back then. But if you, uh, if you get 20 or 25% of the population, I used to speculate that that could have a significant dampening effect. I'm less optimistic about that now. Uh, there are some prison studies uh, that suggests until you get to 60%, 65%, the virus doesn't slow down at all in transmission. Uh, you know, that's a pretty closed circle in inside a prison, so it may not be applicable uh, to society at large, uh, but it's worrisome. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about vaccines. I, I referenced that in passing earlier. Of course, long before the coronavirus, there were anti-vaccination, there was an anti-vaccination crowd. And then now there's concern that a vaccine, a vaccine might be rushed for political purposes. I guess a couple of questions. What do you think about that? To what degree is that tension a problem? And two, are you optimistic that a vaccine will come along that will actually be effective and that people will take? Uh, a lot of questions in there. Number one, I actually do trust the process. You know, uh, Han, the FDA commissioner, has said he's going to allow an advisory commission to make decisions. Uh, I know Tony Fauci. I have total trust in Tony Fauci. Uh, and Francis Collins, the head of NIH, uh, whom I don't know, but I still uh, you know, have total trust in him. They are not going to endorse a vaccine unless it's safe. Uh, so, you know, having public have confidence in that is more complicated. Uh, you know, that's what I was saying earlier. I'm, I'm 
hopeful that you'll get some kind of uh, nonpartisan or bipartisan endorsement of the vaccine. Uh, it's unlikely to come before the election. Uh, so that takes a lot of the politicization out of it. If it arrives after the election, you know, maybe you actually hard as it might be to imagine a Biden, Trump, Trump, Biden joint announcement on the safety of a vaccine, but you know, maybe I'm fantasizing on that. Uh, in terms of effectiveness, you know, we, we don't know, you know, uh, the uh, AstraZeneca trial, I think, just restarted. I was looking at the paper the, just this morning. Uh, but until that pause, every single piece of news we got about a vaccine was good news, not mm -hmm. bad news. Uh, all of it. Uh, that still doesn't tell you how effective it's going to be. It also doesn't tell you uh, not just how effective in the sense of protecting you from getting sick, which is the most important thing, but nobody's really discussed this. There's this concept of a sterilizing vaccine, which is so good it actually prevents you from getting infected. Hmm. And a vaccine that protects you from getting sick. There's the big difference between those two. Mm -hmm. And because you have asymptomatic transmission of this disease, which is pretty unusual. It, it's possible that a disease, a, a vaccine could prevent you from getting sick and be very good at that, mm. but not stop transmission. Uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen there. If it doesn't stop transmission, then, you know, it's going to be very important to get large percentages of the public to accept it. Uh, you know, it's, it's dicey. I think the, some of the things that might help that is uh, convincing younger people, not just people in their, in their 20s, but, you know, 30s, 40s, that there's so much we don't know about this disease. We do know it attacks the heart. We do know it attacks the entire cardiovascular system for that matter. We do know it has neurological impacts. We do know that, and I'm talking about asymptomatic people, people have no symptoms whatsoever who are young, uh, uh, that their heart is infected. Is it, it, It's not only infected, it's affected. Uh, there is damage there. We, we don't know how serious that is, how long lasting it'll be, what long-term repercussions there will be. Uh, we also know that people with no symptoms whatsoever have enough damage to the lung that it shows up on scans. Uh, same thing. We don't know how long lasting, what, what the repercussions and so forth and so on of that damage is. Uh, is if people would recognize the potential danger of this disease and not just think of it as, as uh, something that's dangerous to old people, that would be a major advantage. Of course, that all comes back to messaging and the messaging that we've gotten for political reasons has been, you know, abhorrent as far as I'm concerned uh, and incomprehensible. Uh, in my view, if Trump had taken charge of this the way he should have, he probably could have guaranteed his reelection. Uh, you know, Merkel in Germany hit 77%, you know, skyrocket uh, because she's done such a good job with this. But, you know, he, he chose another route, unfortunately. Another question. In the current pandemic, several populous countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, like Thailand and Vietnam, appear to have been spared mass fatalities during the initial waves of spread. Explanations differ, but perhaps some sort of immunity exists due to the spread of other related coronaviruses. Did anything similar happen during 1918's pandemic? Well, first, I, I'm not sure that I buy that uh, speculative explanation for what's gone on in Asia. Uh, uh, Vietnam has been pretty much as aggressive as China was uh, in trying to shut it down, for example. 
Uh, I think they now have like 10 deaths for a long time. They had zero deaths. Uh, but, you know, an authoritarian state can do all sorts of things. And they were extremely aggressive uh, and had the warning that China did not have. Uh, in terms of 1918, I've actually, you know, already sort of addressed that uh, when I was saying the uh, case mortality in the developed world was probably two to two and a half percent uh, because there was cross protection from other viruses. Uh, the case mortality in the less developed world uh, was generally, you know, six to eight uh, percent. And, you know, because they, they, the immune systems, people, no protection whatsoever, no cross protection, no prior exposure to influenza. Uh, you know, there. I, I read the scientific papers on you know other coronaviruses. It, it remains to be seen. It's interesting. You know, uh, not established, uh, possible. Got it. Another question: Is the difference in death rate uh, between then and now due to the disease itself, or due to modern medicine mitigating the deadliness of COVID nineteen? It's a virus. That was the 1918 virus was a very, very nasty virus. Uh, you know, you put it in experimental animals today and it kills them, uh, which ordinary influenza doesn't do. Uh, most people even in 1918 probably died from, um, not even, but they probably died from bacterial pneumonia, secondary infections. But even today with modern medicine, uh, the case mortality rate for uh, bacterial pneumonia following influenza is 8%. That's pretty high. Of course, it was higher than that in 1918. Uh, but the, the 1918 virus was special. Do you buy the theory that the origin of this virus was the wet market in Wuhan? And um, if so, Shouldn't those wet markets in China and elsewhere around the world be shut down? Well, I don't know that. I think it's been established by now, pretty solid data, that it was circulating prior to that, that first hypothesis that it all came from the wet market. Uh, I think it was around, so it did not come from the wet market. I think that's pretty well established. At least I'm convinced of it. Uh, but the question of the wet markets is, is a different uh, question. They, they are dangerous. Uh, you know, you bring all sorts of animals together, very unsanitary. Uh, they, they, you know, swap all sorts of uh, pathogens between themselves and, you know, and humans are, are right there. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's the pretty dangerous and and uh, potential source of future so-called spillover events where animal pathogens uh, jump species to humans. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, the European response to this virus versus the American one? You touched on Germany, but if you could elaborate on that a bit. Well, Germany is one of the leaders over there. There are other countries that have done very well. Uh, Denmark, there are some that haven't done so well, uh, although they've all done better than the United States. Uh, Britain, uh, France, Spain, Italy, obviously, have, have all done pretty poorly. Uh, and then you have the Swedish experiment uh, with herd immunity, which I think has been oversimplified uh, you know, they, they didn't just want to let the uh, virus run free. Their idea was to protect the elderly, which they failed to do. Uh, they didn't close the economy down. They did urge people to, uh, you know, socially distance and so forth and so on. Uh, it, it turns out they had a very, very high per capita death rate. Uh, and the architect of that their strategy himself has set a, I guess, probably a couple months ago now, uh, that he wouldn't do it again. He would do something between what he did and the shutdowns that the other countries did. Uh, their economy suffered every bit as much. Uh, 
largely because it wasn't really independent. It was very tied to the economies around them. Uh, so I think the suite of Chicago, you know, and there was over 20 leading scientists in, um, in Sweden who not so long ago wrote a letter condemning the approach, saying that it had proved a, a failure. Uh, so I, I wouldn't go that route for sure. Uh, you know, the countries that have done well around the world, whether it was in Europe or Asia or Senegal, which is uh, foreign policy recently ranked uh, 36 countries uh, for their response, ranked New Zealand number one and Senegal, country with no resources, number two. Uh, mm -hmm. The US it ranked is 31st out of 36. Uh, what they shared in common was number one, taking it seriously, and number two, telling the truth to the public. So when they sought cooperation, they were able to get it. Uh, there were a lot of different strategies employed. Uh, but, you know, Senegal, again, truth telling, they have very few resources. The U.S. has almost 300 doctors uh, per 100,000. Senegal has seven. Uh, and, and yet they got cooperation, testing, tracing, and so forth. Uh, it's possible even in a low resource community. Um, Africa, where there was supposed to be really a disastrous spread, uh, in general has done much better than expected. Uh, and epidemiologists and virologists are trying to figure out why. Hmm. don't really, they, they don't have, they don't, I don't want to count myself among them. Uh, they don't have an answer yet. Very interesting, but very encouraging. It is very interesting. Final question. Uh, we've got just a couple of more minutes. A uh, question about the media. Do you think in general the media today has been more helpful or less helpful in combating the pandemic? I think definitely more helpful with the exception of Fox. You know, I think the information that you've gotten from CNN uh, has been terrific. Uh, you know, Sanjay Gupta was on there every night for, you know, it seemed forever. Uh, he was extremely helpful in, in conveying some, some very, very, I mean, everything he said was, was accurate. Uh, you know, I, I think the media in most crises in my lifetime has really risen to the occasion. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Fox you know, chose to go the political route uh, and you know, whatever. John Barry, thank you so much for being with us today. This has been just as I knew it would be a very, very insightful and timely talk. We're in your debt for educating us about the pandemic of a century ago and the pandemic of today, the similarities, the differences and what we can learn from it. Next Sunday, everyone, please join us again, same hour, 11 to 1145, when our speaker will be Christian Appy, a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and he will talk about the Vietnam War. Again, my thanks to John Barry, and my thanks to all of you for joining us. Thank you.